Hi, good evening. Welcome to the fourth session of the Youth Art Power program. So let me briefly introduce this program. It is the first youth art dosing training program initiated by K11 Art Foundation for young people to build skills and develop a passion for viewing art. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Lisa Mansella, who is going to share with us her rich experience in engaging learners from different age groups and backgrounds and many educational programs that she created in the past. Lisa is the director of Young Learners at the Museum of Modern Art. She has been working in the field of museum education for over 25 years and participated in the development of the MoMA Learning website, as well as the first three MoMA Massive Open Online courses. So the topic today is Art and Inquiry, Connecting Art with People's Lives. During this session, please feel free to ask any questions by using the chat feature or raise a hand on Zoom. I will tell Lisa uh, when I see your questions. Of course, we can also have a very quick Q&A towards the end of this session. So please have your pencil and paper ready. We'll be doing some fun activities later. And please be reminded to uh, switch on your cam if you haven't. So now, Please join me in welcoming Lisa. Hi, Lisa, let me pass the time to you. Hi, everyone. Hello. How is everyone doing today? Thumbs up, medium thumb. Show me, give me a, how are we feeling? A little, maybe a little in between. Okay, some too. Okay. Good evening, everyone too. Thank you for um, joining me on this evening. I'm just gonna scroll through here so I can see everybody. So I'm gonna go to the second page. This is so exciting. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, it's really an honor to be here with you all and you know, be having this conversation about, um, about my practice, about this practice that you're all engaging in. Um, you know, I just think it's amazing that you all were interested in being part of this progr program and be part of this inaugural group. Um, this is a subject that I'm extremely passionate about, and I'm just really excited to, um, you know, have this experience with you all. So, um, you know, again, absolutely, like as we go through the presentation, if folks have questions, you know, we can actually address them really throughout the presentation. Um, once we get to the modeling portion, I'm going to have you all unmuting and actually um, sharing your thoughts because we're actually going to engage in some um, inquiry around artworks together. We're going to do some writing, some drawing. So um, you'll hear me cue you about that. Um, so without further ado, I'll just go ahead and start sharing my presentation and we will, we will kick this off. So here we go. Okay. Great. And if for some reason, you know, you can't hear me or, or see anything, obviously cue me and let me know. So um, here is where I work. It is the Museum of Modern Art. This is where the museum is. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of, of information about the museum. Um, we're in Midtown Manhattan, um, which is you know a bustling part of the city, kind of in, almost in the center of Manhattan Island. Um, and this is the main entrance to the museum, which is on 53rd Street, which is in between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue um, in Manhattan. And then this is our collection. This is just a brief look at the well over 250,000 objects that we have in the collection. Um, we have paintings. Um, here's one of our most iconic paintings that I'm probably sure you all know. We have photography, we have sculpture, we have drawings, prints, um, film, media performance, architecture and design. So we have a, um, you know, a collection that spans the, you know, 1850s, so mid 19th century to the present day. So hence, while we are, uh, you know, a museum of modern and contemporary art, and in terms of our teaching and engaging with audiences, um, we are, um, you know, dealing with the, the whole collection um, as much as can be on view at any one time. So, you know, in regard to that, there's a lot of things that happen at the museum, and I'm just going to 
you know, share a little bit about some of the work we do in school and teacher programs. So, you know, I've been working uh, within, you know, museums for almost, yeah, now almost 30 years now. And I've always worked um, focusing primarily on K-12, primary, secondary schools, teachers. But then in my time at MoMA, I've also expanded some of that to lifelong learners as well through some of the digital projects that I'll show you in a minute. Um, but this is just an example of one of the very common occurrences in the gallery where we'll be sitting in front of artworks. This is an example of us using some viewfinders. We're about to do some, some deep looking with some teachers uh, around some artworks. And then, of course, we have um, school students that come and visit the museum, and those students will take part in tours that are thematic-based tours. So we always center our exploration um, around artworks, around a theme, which we'll, we're not going to really focus on theme today, but if you have been in any of the Coursera courses like Art and Ideas Teaching with Themes, um, you know, I sort of go through that there. So as an example, you know, places and spaces, narrative, identity, things like that. And so part of that is having conversation with students, um, but also taking part in, you know, multimodal activities. And in this example, there's a museum educator at the museum, um, sort of embodying one of the sculptures. In this case, it's a David Smith sculpture called Australia. And then in addition to, this is another example of a teacher workshop, just giving you another example of the types of activities that we do at the museum. These aren't things that we just do with school and teacher audiences, just so you know, we do these type of activities with all audiences. So adult audiences, we'll do drop and drawing programs and you know all sorts of engagements. Um, that really take part across the learning and engagement team. Uh, so, you know, all to say that, you know, these aren't things, the things I'm going to share are things that we do use across the department. And of course, you know, the lens that I use often is to show how, you know, teachers, how they can incorporate inquiry and activities into classroom curriculum. So that's just another sort of layer that we put on top of the, the process and we'll tailor um, really to any group that we work with and any needs um, that they have. So, um, you know, this is one of the digital projects that I worked on um, and it's called the MoMA Learning website. And so in addition to engaging with learners and students on site, we also over the years have worked on digital projects. So this is one of the first big digital projects um, that I worked on. Um, and around the same time, we were rethinking how we could maybe deliver um, online courses. So the work that came out of um, MoMA Learning really showed us that, you know, everybody wants to engage with art. So we started um, a, pro a partnership with the Coursera folks. Um, we started off with, you know, one course, then it went to two teacher courses, then it went to three. And now I think we have a total of nine courses if you could include the Mandarin translation of seeing through photographs. So um, we've continued to do this work. We will continue to do it. I was very fortunate to be part of this team that would engage in um, this process very early on. So I think it was, we launched the MoMA Learning website, I think in 2012. And later that year we started, um, we launched the first Coursera course. Um, so it was just a really exciting project that continues. And so I think you guys have experienced with these courses, but I strongly um, suggest really any of the courses, the teacher courses, or even, um, you know, the other courses that we have on contemporary art and design, and there's just a lot of great content there. So just this idea of how we can share locally and on site, um, but also trying to do some of this work um, digitally. So uh, the last thing I'm showing you here is just an example of some of the teacher lessons that we uh, create every week and put on our website. These are lessons that really anybody can engage with and use, um, but these are ones specifically that a lot of teachers um, come to our website to use. We started doing these the last few years when more and more teachers were needing digital resources. Um, so this is an ongoing project that we have um, that also connects to uh, you know, our teaching practice on site. So, but also, um, you know, an opportunity to give teachers and, and those that might want to kind of bring the works into the classroom um, quickly an opportunity to do so. So some close looking, a little bit of information and an activity and an option to share. So again, a lot of these things do also mirror kind of what we do across the department, but, you know, I'm kind of showing this as a lens from the K-12 side of things.
So here's what we're gonna do over the course of this next sort of 45, 50 minutes or so. Um, we're gonna engage in the process ourselves. We're gonna talk about the why and how as a way to debrief from the experience that we have together. And then hopefully we're gonna have some fun in the process. So um, this is where we're gonna go ahead and actually go ahead and get your pencils and paper ready. And what I want you to do first is I want you to just take a minute or 30 seconds to a minute to look at this artwork on the screen and feel free to adjust your slider and your screen on your end to give you the maximum sort of size of the image. And what you're seeing is um, an artwork image from two different perspectives. So you can look at both. They are just letting you know they are the same image. And I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to a minute to just look and then what I'd like you to do is write down one word to describe this artwork. So if you already have your art, your word, go ahead and write that down. And it's really just like your top level kind of, you know, what comes to your mind, you know, first, first to mind as you look at this artwork. And again, I'm just going to give you 30 more seconds to do that. And then what I'd like you to do in a moment, once you've had a chance to look at the artwork, and as you're looking at the artwork, even if it's, if it's an artwork you think you're familiar with, I want you to just really take a deep look, right? So sort of top to bottom, left to right of the image. Try to notice as much as you can. And then, this is where you, you all are going to be invited um, to unmute yourselves and share. And we'll just sort of, what you'll do is you'll unmute, you'll share, you'll mute again. That way we can hear as many people as we can without sort of talking all over each other. Um, and we'll also pull responses from the chat. Um, so what I'd love is for folks to share, and I'm going to take some notes about these words. What are some of the words that come to mind when you look at this artwork? Um, the first thing that comes into my mind is the word battered. Say the word again. Battered. Like B-A-T-T-E-R-E-D. Sorry, uh, can you hear me? Say it one more time. Sorry, I didn't hear it all. I didn't hear the whole thing. Go ahead. Can you spell again more slowly? B-A-T-T-E-R-E-D. Oh, battered, battered, got it. Thank yes, you. Yes, battered. Battered, great. Someone give me another word. Um, it reminds me of the word escape. Escape. Yeah. Great. So we've got battered, escape. Tell me more. Hello. I think of the word crowded. Crowded. Great. Battered, escape, crowded. What else? I think it is thrilling. Thrilling? Yes. Ooh, okay, great. So we've got battered, escape, crowded, thrilling. Let's take a few more. Um, I thought of a word, it's um, attack. Attack, okay. Great. Okay, Tom. Let's get some more. And in, in just so you know, if we were sitting in front of this artwork, I would probably go around in a circle and have each of you give me one. Um, just a little meta moment, just to let you know how I facilitate that. Um, and, you know, everyone can share or not everyone can share. So, you know, obviously in Zoom, it's a little bit different. So yeah, give, let's, let's get a couple of more words. So we've got battered, escape, crowded, thrilling, attack. What else? I think of the word painstaking. Painstaking. Great. Yeah, a couple more. And and everyone again, feel free to I would say it is it is a wall. Say that one more time. Uh I'm sorry. I would say it's it is a wall. W A R war. So the word war comes. Okay. Great. 
battered, escape, crowded, thrilling, attack, painstaking, war. Great. Later, Tell me more. I yep. Have a word. I have a word from Tom. Yes. Who can't unmute himself right now. So he's mm -hmm. vulner vulnerability. Oh, good word. Vulnerability. These are great. Great. How about a couple more? I think of a word oppressed. Oppressed. Okay. Great. Any other words? Hello, my word um, is victory. Victory. Okay, great. And then, yeah, I think I heard someone else. Go ahead and tell me your word. Yeah, I, I thought a cute word is headshot. So say that one more time. Hedgehog. The animal. Hedgehog. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Hedgehog. That's great. That's great. Any, any, anyone else want to throw out a word? Okay, so I'm going to read these back to you. Here's our word list. Battered, escape, crowded, thrilling, attack, painstaking, vulnerability, oppressed, victory, hedgehog. So what do you all notice about, about I have two questions. Um, well, the first one is, is there anyone who has a question? Like, did anyone hear a word that they wanna, they have a question about and they wanna ask what, what, what the person saw that made them say that word? I have a few questions, but I'm gonna put it out to you guys first. So again, was anybody like, well, hmm, that's an interesting word. Why did you say that? So did anyone, anyone hear a word that they wanna know more about from the person who said it? I think victory is an interesting one. Oh. Yeah, who, who does the victory um, word word chooser? Do you want to? Uh, that's terrible grammar. The person who said victory, would you like to tell us? Tell us what you see here that that speaks victory to you. What what do you notice in this artwork that says that? Um, hello, um, I because when I saw this photo and. <laughs> there is a short story coming comes to my mind and I think um there was a there was a war and and some soldiers uh riding on this boat and they they are attacked by many arrows and finally they they can achieve the victory. <laughs> right. So that's so it's interesting, right? So the the victory, so um, for those that don't know this story, right, this is a connection to history, and we're going to hear a little bit more from the artist soon, um, the artist's name is Saigo Chang, but it's interesting, right, so is there anything, so even if you didn't know the story, right, now you know a little bit about the story, is there anything visually that, that speaks victory when you look at this? Um, and then, and that's not, there's no one right answer to this. I'm, I'm just curious if anyone sees anything that, that is reminiscent of that word. Now that you know a little bit about it. Is there a flag at the rear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so maybe, and again, like it might not speak victory to some of us, right? It might be purely about the story, right? But we see, we see the arrows, we see the flag, right? So um, yeah, so it's it's just a way to visually we're we're starting to sort of make these connections. Um, let's go back to our word list for a second and let's think about, or did anyone else have any questions about any of these other words? So again, I'm gonna say battered, escape, crowded, thrilling, attack, painstaking, war, vulnerability oppressed hedgehog. Does anyone have a question about any of these words and want to talk more about what folks see that make them say that? I was curious. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think no, of no, the Chinese story of how the army didn't have any arrows, so they 
make some fake body by grass and then uh, mm -hmm. the enemy's arrow just like they they shoot the arrow to the fake body and then they can have enough arrow for the fight and then we have the chinese flag on the boat so i at the first sight i see this work i thought of maybe it's about a political uh, statement that mm -hmm. the chinese is using its enemies um capital to win the war yeah yeah right so again you're making this connection to some prior knowledge that you bring which is the 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 history right so we're connecting back to that and then we're starting to wonder and have more questions right so is the artist is Sai Guo Chang trying to make some sort of statement right um so we're going to continue with this idea of really just observing so I, I'm just curious like one, I have two questions. I, I was interested in hearing what else do we notice about this artwork? Um, what are the things that capture your attention, right? So, um, you know, we have these words that we came up with and there's these, you know, things that we've seen that kind of have inspired those words. So just more generally now, like what are some other things you notice about this artwork? Like, I think my very first impression of this artwork is that I noticed like this is not like an organic shape. So it makes me think about, oh, actually, what is like, what is, what is it like on top of that surface? And I noticed that, oh, there's an arrow, but then underneath the arrow, it is like a boat. So I think yeah. afterward, I just like sort of like start making connection between like your arrows and the boat. So yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So it's like, so what we're talking about is we're now breaking down the pro like the materials, right? And the sort of process. So we see arrows, everyone has seen the arrows, they've seen the flag. What other materials do you notice? Um, I realized that for like the body of the boat or yes. the entire artwork, um, mm -hmm. it somehow shows like the raw materials of a boat so it doesn't look mm -hmm. like a very polished or very um stylish kind of boat but it also makes me wonder whether this boat is um deliberately made like this or is it actually something that is already made or it has been um uh, like it's uh it has been collected instead of uh, actually made for this artwork yeah, so that's really interesting, right? So now we've heard we've heard a few different things. We've heard about the arrows, about the shape. So people have already, a couple of people made reference to the shape and calling it a boat, which it is a boat. We know that for sure, or I can tell you that it is. And that now we're looking at the nature more specifically of how the boat is constructed. And the comment was that it doesn't look like, and tell me if I'm wrong about this. I think I heard that it's not like a um uh like a fancy boat. It's like clearly like this is like, you know, there's questions about it, like its age, its stability, its construction, right? So now we've got like flags, we've got this boat, we've got these arrows. Are there any other materials that you notice when you look at the two images? Okay. Um, if I'm not mistaken, okay. first. Um, I think I can see there is an engine at the end of the boat, which is um maybe a modern material, and yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. So, right, you see my cursor here. So someone's saying that this is maybe an engine, right? And over here, I'm gonna move my cursor around the flag. That's the back view. It's not the greatest view, right? So the question is, is this some sort of engine? Right, so it's like a like a, a mechanical. It's actually um, I can tell you, um, it's a fan that's in the back. So you're right; it is a mechanical um, object that's incorporated. So we have arrows, we have the boat, we have a flag, um, we have this fan, and then the other person who is going to share. Why don't you tell us what you notice in terms of um, anything or even materials, whatever you notice? Go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say there's like a mechanical thing at the back of the boat, and yeah. also there's like a random log lying on the boat. Yes, like this right here, or this yeah. right here. Yeah, between the two, right? There's this material 
that we see wrapped up here. And then we see this log going across, right? And I'm going to put it here. So it's, it's this, it's a shape that's like recognizable, but it's not totally recognizable. So here's my question now. Now that we've talked about the materials, let's think about how do you think this artwork was made? So we've talked about our materials. We've talked a little bit about um, some prior knowledge that you all have brought in about this possible connection to this story. We know that there's arrows, right? And I can tell you that for sure. We know that this is like an old boat, which it is. We have this flag, this fan. How do you think the artist, again, the artist is Sai Kuo Chang. How do you think this artwork was made? What do you think that process was like for the artist? Um, firstly, I think from brainstorming, I think it definitely connects back to the artist, maybe interest or passion that culture or maybe like like the artist the artists themselves are from that culture mm -hmm. also i think like maybe through the process maybe he recycled one of the one of the old boats that he, mm -hmm. he had or he found and somehow I don't know, maybe he definitely did not put that on the floor and just put all the arrows up because like, I know like a foreign part of that boat, like I don't think you can put the arrows, like how do you call it? Like how you can stuff those arrows like from like, the really from like on the floor. So like probably mm -hmm. hang it up to put it up. That's yeah. a really interesting, so I'm gonna repeat that. So it's interesting, right? So again, there was a comment about um, connections to, to histories and yes, and I'm going to share a little information in a minute, but uh, there was some historical connection. So one process, right, an artist can make is looking back to history and potentially connecting to that. And then, then we're getting into this deeper kind of focusing on my, uh, the core of my question was around like, what's the actual like physical process? And I think that's a really good comment. The first comment was, that he, you know, clearly like recycled an old boat or like, did he find it? Here's a question, like, you know, did he find it? Did he recycle it? Did he build it himself? And then also this idea that there's all these, and this, this reminds me of the word someone said, painstaking. And when I look at the arrows, I think painstaking, because to your point also, if you want to put all these arrows in this boat, I'm not sure you can put it on the ground and do that, right? So I think that's really interesting. So tell me more. Let's get one more um, thought about this. How did the, how tell me more about the process that we just by looking and observing how we think the artist might have made this artwork. What's one more thing we can add to that? I'm just guessing that you would first have the skeleton of the boat up in the air, and then you would have um, the artist using a staircase or um, I don't know, a crane or something that mm -hmm. helps them lift up mid-air and so that mm -hmm. you could painstakingly stick all of the <laughs> arrows um, to the boat. Um, yeah, because it, I, I cannot think of a way where you can do this on the ground. Yeah, right? So it's interesting, right? Just, just think about that for a minute. Maybe close your eyes or not and just think, and try to imagine that in your mind. And when I look at this, one of the words that I wrote down when you guys were, when we were all writing our words, the word that I wrote down was wrapping, right? Because there's also these areas of connection, right? I see things that are integrated and connected and kind of wrapping together. Um, so thank you for sharing all that, super interesting. And um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna keep the conversation going, but I just wanna share a little bit of information with you. This is an artwork in our collection. Um, it is actually, you'll see here, it's by, I already said already, it's Sai Kuo Chang. The artwork was made in 1988. Um, for those of you that don't know, he's a living artist. Um, he actually lives, I think he's still here in New York. Um, and this title of this artwork is called Borrowing Your Enemy's Arrows. So um, we had that piece sort of already figured out even without kind of needing a lot of information. And you'll see the medium is in fact a wood boat. Um, and that's our wood boat here. 
Then it says canvas sale. That's actually this object right here. Arrows, metal, rope, Chinese flag, and electric fan. So that's our another piece of information. So we now have the title of the artwork. We have the year it was made. We know who the artist is. We know that it's a living artist. And we know the medium. And this is just a little bit of information that I'm sharing from um, the publication MoMA Highlights. Um, so I'm just going to read this. And it says, borrowing your enemy's arrows delivers a timeless message rooted in Chinese philosophy and expressed in the Western vocabulary of the ready-made. Built on the skeleton of an old fishing boat excavated near Sai's birthplace, the sculpture suspended above ground is pierced with 3,000 made in China arrows and flies the national flag. The title, which alludes to a text from the third century, um, and if someone wants to, I'm gonna say this incorrectly, so if someone wants to correct me, known as Zhu Zhang, Zhang Zhuzi. If anyone wants to jump in and say that later, please feel free. I know I said it incorrectly, so I apologize. It refers to an episode in which the general Zhu Ling, and again, apologies if I'm saying this incorrectly, um, facing an imminent attack from the enemy, manages to rep replenish a depleted stores of arrows. According to the legend, they, were tri they tricked the enemy by sailing across the Yangtze River through the thick mist of early dawn with a surrogate army made of straw while his soldiers remained behind, yelling and beating on drums. So um, mistaking the pandemonium for a surprise attack, the enemy showered the decoys with volley of arrows. Thus the general returned triumphantly with a freshly captured store of weapons. So um, now that I shared that, that piece of information, um, how does that inform the conversation that we just had about the artwork? What does that, what does that add to our exploration? Does it add anything? Um, does it help answer questions? Does it, does it give us more questions? What are your thoughts about that type of information? How does it help our understanding of the artwork? I think like for us, like look, um, reading the description, it like connects to us more because uh, we actually, we already are familiar with like the history and the story. And also like there's, I think I am still like having question about the flag and also the fan because I don't think mm -hmm. like the artist wants to make like the connection with like modern society, but I don't know, I'm still thinking about it, but then maybe for people yeah. who don't come from like the, the same culture will have like um, some trouble or like they need more time to understand this art piece. So I guess, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And just to drop into a meta moment for a second, um, interestingly, folks connect to this artwork very easily. Because I've taught like people from all over the world about this artwork, obviously a lot of local students, but, and because I, we share often this information about the story, um, what's interesting, and, and so hold that thought for a second, but it's interesting because even you knowing the history had some questions, right? So you can know the history of something and still have a question about what you're experiencing, right? And it's not necessarily no one needs to know all the answers and all the history. Like, you know, for the sake of this artwork, right? This is some information that we can share that that does connect to it, right? Without going into like, you know, basically a long like explanation, right? So, um, but I wanna get back to that idea of information in a little bit, but I also wanna just go to the next slide and ask you this question now. So this is just another view of the artwork when it's installed in the new galleries. The left side images are from actually the old MoMA. I just love those images. But once we expanded in 2005, here's an image of it. And you'll actually notice here when it's installed now, generally the fan's going. So you can kind of see the flag going here. Um, but this just gives you another view. So my next question is, even though we know the, you know, you said, even though, you know, you knew the story, it's still this question about why the artist made the choices that the artist made, you know, even with that uh, like more connected understanding of the background. So my next question is, what do you think is the message of this artwork? And, it, and it, there's no right answer, right? This is really 
and it's completely open-ended. So now that you've had some, some time to look at it, what do you think the message is? So you know a little bit of information, you've done your observation. I think the first thing we can So I think the first thing we can like think about is that the word that came to our mind when we first saw the art piece. Yeah. And then we can relate that kind of um, word to um, the backstory. And then mm -hmm. I think what the artwork is trying to say is that China, because there's like some modern elements in the boat, so mm -hmm. I think it represents the challenges that China faced when mm -hmm. in the course of modernization. But uh -huh. uh, in the end, China comes out unscathed. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Right. So maybe it's representing um, strength and 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 like, or I should say, challenge, and then how you kind of overcome challenge, right? Yeah, and maybe it is this very specific representation um, that's very specific to China in particular, right? That's one interpretation. What else? Maybe let's get one or two more interpretations. Um, I think uh, the arrow is on the boat. Um, in some culture, we might think that you will get hurt. Uh, you are hurting yourself or the enemy is hurting you. If their uh, arrows is hitting your boat. But in the story, it means a victory because the purpose of he doing so is to borrow the arrows from the enemy. Mm -hmm. So from the outside, we might think that something happens. So it is a threat or a harm to them. But in reality, it is not. It is just a trick to um, borrow something from the others. And yeah. This is right. what I thought. Yeah, so it may look like it's a, like a like a challenging conflict, back to this idea of challenge, but there was this um, strength and power that came from that and ultimately was a victory by, by borrowing from the enemy, taking away from the enemy um, and being like strategic in that way, it actually is, a, is, a, is more, um, it, it is a victory, right? It's not a defeat. Great. Does anyone else want to share one more interpretation? And then we're I going to hear from the artist. The artist is going to say uh, Chinese people is so smart that um, they think of a strong strategy that borrow the enemy's arrows and win the wars. Yeah. So again, like maybe it's like highlighting um, strength and ingenuity and yeah. Yeah, these are all really great. And again, there's no right or wrong answer to this. I'm just gonna give you a moment um, to hear from the artist. Um, this is a very, very short video. So, and hopefully the sound will be okay, but it's also, I mean, it's subtitled in English, so you'll be able to follow along. So let's hear what Sai Guocheng said.我是在我们的家乡的海边而且我希望把那个船里面的骨架
迅速成长了自己。所以有一个非常足智多谋的将军叫诸葛亮，他把船上这炸满了稻草人，在迷雾中开进敌营。敌人就以为他真真正的那个大军来到了，所以从岸边铺天盖地的箭射到了船上。这个船是因为熟我很熟悉的船身，人类最早认识到这个重力和自己关系的一个载体。当这个船插满了箭，它身上都是羽毛的时候，它突然像一只鸟一样可以飞翔起来的感觉。Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is. Now that we've learned about the artwork, I want you to write down another word to describe this artwork. So write down a second word. I'm just gonna give you 30 seconds to do that. And then as soon as you have a word, Folks can just go ahead and uh, begin to unmute, and just go ahead and tell us tell us your words, and everyone can just take turns. So now we've gone through the experience, and we're just writing another word. My word is resourceful. Great, thank you. Resourceful. Tell me more. Um, delusional. Delusional. Great. Tell me more. Sarcasm. Can you say it one more time? I'm sorry. I'm outdoor. Sorry, but、uh, my word is sarcasm. Sarcasm. Thank you. Tell me more. Recycling. Recycling. Great. I would say it's innovation. Innovation. Great. One more. Feathery, feathery. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we've got resourceful, delusional, sarcasm, recycling, innovation, feathery, and then our words from before our engagement: battered, escape, crowded, thrilling, attack, painstaking, war, vulnerability, oppressed, victory, hedgehog. And I, I, I so agree with hedgehog. I just got to say I love that because to me it totally reminds me of a hedgehog. So I'm going to stop sharing for one minute. So that I can see all of you for a second, and、um, we're gonna we're gonna meta about this. But my question to you is:、um, before I start going through the sort of why of this stuff, and and just quickly going through inquiry and kind of like breaking down the process a little bit, what was that experience like for you all? Looking at this artwork together, just describe: is there anything that you noticed about our time together looking at the artwork? Is there anything you noticed like? Yourself, like about your experience, and/or something that I did in particular. What did you I notice? I guess it's always fun to have like your own perspective and like your imagination of that artwork before you don't know like the backstory of that piece and also the artist. But then, like once you. Like get to know the artist story and also like this, yeah, and like the story of the piece. You be like, oh, like this is interesting, and also you'd be like, did I think too much? <laughs> this is what I thought. Yeah, yeah. So, and tell me if I'm saying this right. So, like, it's interesting, right? So we can there. There's this. There's this moment where you want to give people entry points into works of art, and you want to give them. Information, but at the same time, you were saying that I think your comfort level—you you seem to get a comfort level when you knew a little bit of information. But I didn't give you a lot of information, right? So, like, we read a little bit what the curator said, and then we eventually heard from the artist. But we didn't like spend hours and hours talking about information. You know what I mean? So, like, but it's interesting, right? There's this this 
the more we get into the process and it's this process of like asking questions, giving a little information, asking questions, you can increase people's comfort level, right? So thank you for that. Is there any other um, things you noticed about um, what I did your, or, or, and wanna share about your experience going through the process? Um, I think that it's important that everyone has like their own interpretation. And also what's interesting is that even if you don't know um, like the history or you cannot make any connections um, culturally, I think it's also important that some of our uh, perspectives or even interpretation somehow complements each other's. So it's like, even if you have noticed a minor thing or it's just something from the structure, it's also, uh, it has also like complemented someone else, um, uh, someone else's interpretation. So that's quite uh, rewarding. Yes, thank you. So absolutely. We don't all come from the same perspective. And even in this group, you don't all come from the same perspective, but we together collectively engage in this meaning making together. And what's great is the minute someone says something, it could potentially spark something for somebody else, right? And then it, all of a sudden, all these connections start to weave together and we can come together to even critique. Like in some cases, we might wanna critique what an artist is saying. And what's interesting about when you look at artworks is artists can also be very contradictory about their art. <laughs> so you can hear something about an artwork that an artist says, and then you can sometimes hear something else that they'll say that might be different. So that's why we really want to prioritize what the viewers bring, because really what's most interesting is the connections that you all make. What's interesting for me, I love hearing from Sai Guo Chang, but it's the, it's the connections you make that bring it to a fuller experience. Um, yeah, any, can I get, um, anybody else want to, before we move on, just share a little bit about um, what you noticed about the process and your experience. And if not, I can just keep I can just keep going with my presentation. So keep thinking about the process. I'll just go through some slides that really like break it down now. But you know, people can at this point please chime in if you have a question about anything that I'm going to share. And once again, just thank you for being um, part of the process with me. It was super interesting, of course, to share this artwork with you all. Um, so okay, so let's break down. So when we talk about um, this this pedagogy, this museum-based teaching practice. And this is something that, you know, we do at MoMA, other museums do it. This is not, you know, you know, unique to MoMA. Um, you know, there are other museums that engage in this process, right? And so our pedagogy is centered around this idea of constructivist learning. And if you don't know about this, and, and some of you I know are familiar with this content already, but I'll just briefly go through this. Um, so it's really about the learners being actively engaged in the learning process. Um, and it's this idea that we are not going to top down, um, you know, force an understanding onto someone. Um, as we know, um, in even in you know in the states, I'm sure you experienced that there. There's a lot of more traditional learning environments where students, um, and and not always this way. I think schools are changing here, but it's this idea that often very different than in schools where teachers are required to deliver a lot of content. And this goes true. For adults, everything that I'm saying, by the way, like constructivist learning is good for everyone, not just, you know, those who are in schools or in, in that process. Um, but again, it's about the learner being actively engaged um, and, and not uh, this top-down approach. And the two ways that we can think about it um, and the way we approach it in the museum is through these two ways that are totally connected. So inquiry and activity. So the inquiry piece, so having conversation asking questions, right? Um, that's one piece. And we can also engage in multimodal activities. And activities themselves, drawing, writing, movement, those are all things that are forms of inquiry as well. So these things are separate but connected. So I should really put another arrow that connects inquiry and activity to each other's across the bottom. So why do we engage in this process? Um, and again, this is great for everyone, not just students. It supports observation. It supports people being able to communicate their ideas, which is also important, I think, for students. It encourages creativity. Um, it helps develop reasoning and critical thinking skills. And it also helps folks make connections 
um, to the to themselves and to their experience, like how you guys were connecting to yourselves and to others in this experience. So we're going to start with questions, and I asked you several questions, right? So there's two different ways that we can pose questions. Um, there's the cl you know closed questions or didactic questions where there's one right answer, where everything sort of converges into one place. And that's not something that we want to do. We want to ask questions that are open-ended, um, and they're also co called divergent, so opposite of convergent, because they encourage a variety of responses. So rather than closing in on one correct answer, we want to create an environment where everybody's responses are valid and welcome, right? So how do we do that? It, very specifically in the way we want to phrase our questions. So again, we want our questions to be open-ended, invite multiple responses. We want to sequence them from observation to interpretation. Um, we want them to encourage close looking and support the theme and the lesson goals. So your lesson, quote unquote, could be a lesson with students. It could just be an engagement with a group of adults. So insert, you know, it's really, you can take out lessons. So supporting whatever theme or whatever goals, you don't have to teach thematically. We do, you might not be doing that. So this is the pyramid of inquiry, and this is something we talk to teachers a lot about um, by my uh, colleague Nicola, and it's really just giving you an example, a visual of the process, right? So we want to start with observation. The largest part of the pyramid is observation, right? Um, then the next place we would go, so really just what do you see, right? So what do you see? What do you notice? Right. Then we want to start, once we build enough observations, we want to then bring ourselves to the what do you think about what you see? So that's our evidence-based inference. Then we went through that, I went through that process with you. We did some observation. Then I asked you um, a question that was really about what you think about what you see. So I'll just go back for a second. Right, so I asked you what captures your attention, right? I mean, the first thing was really write down one work of art. So I had, had you look first. Then I asked you, what captures your, your attention about this artist, uh, this artwork? What do you notice? Then I kept saying things like, what do you see that makes you say that? Then after I got some responses, we got the conversation going. Then I asked you an evidence-based inference question. How do, you, um, how do you think this artwork is made, right? So I'm having you think about the artwork now. Then I shared a little bit of information. And then I asked you an interpretation question. What do you think? is the message of this artwork. So I'm just gonna bring us back to that period. And you'll notice the information that connects to the interpretation, the glue there, that's a small segment, right? The largest segment of this pyramid is really our observations and our evidence-based inference questions, right? So I just wanna stop there for a second and just, um, see if anybody has any questions about any of that. Did that all make sense to everyone? Okay, I'm gonna assume that's a yes, and I'll just keep going. And again, we can ask questions at the end. So then the other piece that I wanted to really talk about is this idea of summarizing and th synthesizing. So that was something, um, and maybe you noticed discreetly that I did this, um, but as you're going through the conversation, you want to continually be sort of summarizing and synthesizing as you go. And part of that, and someone made a comment about this, is part of that is, one, you want to make sure, just from a practical perspective, sometimes it's hard for people to hear each other. So you really just want to, like, continue to do that. Um, from a sort of, you know, psychological perspective, it's sort of um, validating participants' responses. So great, I'm hearing this, I'm hearing this, right? Um, you'll also notice that I tried to make sure that I was saying exactly what you said. So I would ask often, like, and stop me if this is something that I didn't say. And then the other thing that we were doing is making the connections between all the comments that we were hearing, right? Um, and hopefully the idea is that you're going to bring all of these things together. And someone made a comment about this um, and about bringing these multiple ideas together to help build collective meaning making. So that's sort of the last piece of this, summarizing and synthesizing. And so one thing I also want to say is that it's really important um, when you're going through this process, you'll notice that there were periods of silence, um, periods of you know me pausing, and this is 
a quote that I love by Laurel Schmidt. She writes this article that I can share with you, but some of you may have seen it about inquiry in the Coursera courses. Um, and it's really about um, giving people time to process and don't really be afraid of the silence because sometimes folks just need to think a little bit. Um, so it can be a little bit anxiety producing. So sometimes I like to envision myself I really get into a very Zen place now with folks because I just love being in the energy of people experiencing artwork. So I just, you know, encourage you all to not feel anxious if you hear silence because that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Often it's just people are thinking. So I'm going to stop for a second because I want to do two things. I want to do um, a check on if there are any questions and then I'll also do a time check um, to make sure we don't need to like start to wrap up. Because we, we can also very quickly talk about um, activities and do an activity together as long as we have time. Um, but how, are, how, how did all that land with everyone? Can I answer any questions? Was there anything about that piece that um, you, know, you, have, you have questions or comments about? I'm just going to look at the chat. Yeah, go ahead. I have one question. This might be random, but then, like, how do y'all like transport the like the finished artwork from the artist's place to the museum? Because like you cannot put it on the mm -hmm. floor, but then hanging it and then transport it. Like, I don't know. I just I just want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. And honestly, this is the type of questions you're gonna get. People are gonna ask you a million questions about artworks. So, like, absolutely. And did you notice in the video? did you see the first part so it how it came in two like sort of two pieces it the main part of the boat was in one crate and then all the arrows were in a separate crate and they immediately hung it up and you're going to have access to this presentation and you can just go to our youtube the moma youtube channel has all these videos and they basically just did exactly what someone one of the very first comments when i asked about evidence-based inference how was this made somebody i don't remember who you, you know who you are, said, I think maybe they hung it up, like they couldn't have put it on the floor. And that was exactly right. Just by looking at it, they knew that that's how it was made. So they suspended it and then inserted all the arrows. So that's a really good question. Yeah. And then it has to, the reverse process has to be true, right? It has to be transported and sort of suspended. And that's an interesting part of the artwork process. When you're looking at sculptural works, um, and, you know, more complicated works that are beyond like a two-dimensional object that you're in front of, people are going to ask these questions. Yeah. Any other questions about the artwork, about inquiry, about my process? Like, do you find it hard when, like, you were... I don't know, is there like some point that you, um, wait, how do I replace this? You don't, you, um, uh, you don't hear what, like, wait, how do I replace this? Uh, I'm sorry. No, take your time. Is there some time you're expecting, like, your audience to answer, like, a certain answer? Or like asking you a certain mm -hmm. question or you're just like opening for like everything and also like what do you do when like people's like reaction is not what you expected great questions those are great questions and actually so the first part and i wrote it down i think there was a way i phrased something and you all got quiet and i'm trying to remember the exact question but there was a question that i did not ask the original way I intended to ask it. And you guys were all quiet. And if, and I think this is what you're asking. So yes, sometimes you ask things in a way that people might not respond, but that's okay. So all I did is just rephrase the question a different way. And you get really, it, the more you do it, the easier that gets. So yes, you can't always, and that's why when you ask what you see, the easiest, this is why on the, on the pyramid of inquiry, observation is the big part and the evidence-based inference because you can always go back to what else do you notice? What else do you see here? This, this, this. Well, what do you think about the material? What do you think this, if you could touch this artwork, 
right? Like for younger kids, or if someone's quiet, I could say for those that didn't have a lot to say about maybe, you know, uh, how an artwork's made, I could say, if you could touch this, what do you think it would feel like? Would it feel sharp? Would it feel soft? Right? So there, there are times where you might get folks that are quiet and sometimes people are just a little bit more shy, but you can always go back to, to what you see and rephrase the question and you'll get really good at being able to do that. But, and again, don't be too alarmed by silence. Sometimes people just need a little bit of quiet. And if your audiences, and I know depending on who you're going to be working with, you could be dealing with local folks, international folks. It's, it could be a variety like of ages, right? You can always just pause and rephrase a question. And then the other thing that you can always do is start to insert a little bit of information if you feel like they're ready for that. You know, sometimes people want a little bit of information. So like at one point I said, yeah, so this artwork and all I said is the artist's name is Sai Guo Chang. He's a living artist. He lives here in New York, right? So I started to like slowly kind of like weave in that information to not leave people hanging. So you can always do that as well, but that's a great question. All you need to do is re rephrase a question. And as long as it's open-ended and it's not, you know, tell me exactly what, you know, what is, what did, you know, what exactly did he do? Not what exactly did he do, but as long as the question doesn't have one right answer, you're going to be fine, right? But you'll get, you'll get more comfortable with that. That's a really good question. And it happens all the time. Sometimes I have to rephrase questions. That's a really good one. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, do you yeah. think teaching uh, young children is difficult? Because I think um, they might not easy to understand some of the artwork or some art pieces. So mm -hmm. how would you, uh, what, what um, method would you use to teach them, to let them understand it? Same exact thing I did with you all. Exact same thing. I can tell you right now, I've taught from this artwork from all ages, from five-year-olds to adults, and they totally get it. They totally get it. Now with the younger students, I, I'm not necessarily gonna give them the same information that I gave you. That's the other thing. You don't wanna, first of all, you don't wanna give a ton of information. You wanna give a little bit of information, but younger students have absolutely no problem. Now I'm careful about the artworks I would select, right? But depending on the age of the students, I'm gonna change my questions. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say, what do you notice? But I'm gonna be careful about, if I'm gonna talk to a, like a seven-year-old, I wouldn't necessarily say, like, what do you think the message is in this artwork, right? I might not say that, right? But I might say to them, I want you to think about, like, if you could, like, here's an example of an activity that I would do with the students. And I didn't do it with you all. I would, I've done this activity of students where I say, look at this artwork. I want you to envision a setting where you can imagine this artwork living. And then I have them draw everything that they think they would see. Right. And then we would just talk about their drawings. Right. And be like, oh, that's really, really great. Right. And what words come to your mind? And this, the idea of narrative, young children immediately connect with that because you can say, hey, in school, you read books that have characters and settings and stories. So the, the theme for this artwork with a younger audience would be about storytelling. And they totally get that. So they actually have a, a very easy way. You just have to modify your, um, your questions a little bit, right? And you're not gonna like throw out vocabulary that they absolutely can't understand. But all the words that we talked about, the materials and even the story, they would totally get that. That there was this like, this, you know, this general and he was like going into this battle and like he, he, had, to be, he had to be smart about what was happening, right? And he was like, I'm gonna grab these arrows and I'm gonna use them, right? Like these are all things that kids can understand, but that's a great question. So same exact strategies. You just change the way you ask the questions. You change the information a little bit, right? But I would absolutely share that this was a story he was very familiar with. He pulled from history um, a story. I wouldn't even have to say like he was very familiar with it. I could just say he was inspired by history in making this artwork. So does that, does that make sense? Great. Yeah. Any more questions? And please tell me when we're running out of time too, because I know, I know I want to be careful with people's time.
Um, I have another question is about, um, is there uh, not only one answer of an artwork? And because I, when I look at an artwork, I keep finding what is the artist want to say, what is the artist want to express. And I would do a lot of research before I really like look at it, really um, think of it. And is it not okay to do something like this before, I mean, um, yes. Is it is it not, say that again, is it not okay to do? Like I do a lot of research before I really, um, I mean. Ah, got it. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so to, to, so the first part of your question, there can be multiple meanings in an artwork, right? So again, sometimes you won't have a living artist. I shared, this is an example of, we had Sai Guo Cheng's voice telling us he's a contemporary artist, right? We could be dealing with a historical artwork where we may not know all the answers, right? And sometimes you'll do research, which you should do research. And you might be like, hmm, this artist said this about the artwork here or this over here. Here's an example. There's an artist named Jasper Johns in our collection. You may know him, he's an American artist. He does a whole series of flags, American flags, right? Every time people get in front of them, adults especially, they wanna say, this is political artwork because it's a, a American flag. And when, you, when he quotes it, when you read his quote, he says, this isn't a political artwork. I was just painting an image of a symbol that I knew. Like I, it was easier to start with something I knew than pull from nothing, right? So someone might bring a very, uh, their own interpretation and that's great. You want that. You want people to share their interpretation and it may be in alignment with an artwork, it may not. In terms of the research side, absolutely do research. Go ahead and do all the research. If it makes you feel comfortable, have all that research. I shared three things with you. I shared the, what we call the, the tombstone information or what would be on the label in an art gallery or a museum. That's the first thing I shared. It's right there on the wall. Then I shared what a curator wrote. So someone from MoMA wrote about that artwork. It wasn't what the artist said, it was what the curator said. And then I shared the artist's voice. Those were three things. And then the, so the first piece was really biographical too. So biographical, um, tombstone information and uh, the curator's perspective, and then the artist's perspective. What I generally do is do all my research, and then if this is how much research I've done, I share this much, right? I share what's important for the conversation. Have the information, and if someone asks you a question, you absolutely want to answer it if you can. It's also fine to say, I don't know. I say, I don't know all the time. I'll say, that's a great question. I don't know. I can probably get the answer for you, but it's okay to not know all that all the answers um thank you so i think we it sounds like we have time for maybe one more question i have a yeah. question uh i'd like to know uh when we present one artwork uh, which part is more important we should we must choose to uh, tell the audience uh, because you know we should talk about artist uh histories or uh artist experience or the uh, artwork meaning, I don't know, because the time is very short, short so uh, maybe it's just two minutes, so I don't know which part is more important. Now, this is going to be a little bit specific to your setting, so it depends in the setting and the structure of the program and the engagement, right? So depending on, like, you know, it could be, you know, one hour. Is it like a, is it like a thematic lesson? Is it just a quick gallery talk? It really kind of depends on the, the structure of the program and the context. But I would say, let's say as an example, you only have, if you ha only have like, I mean, three minutes in front of an artwork is very fast. So I, I would encourage you to not go that fast in front of an artwork, like at least have a little bit more time. But I would say if you only have, let's say you only have five minutes in front of an artwork, I think what you want to do is have a balance of these things. You want to share, I think, you, I think it's important to share a little bit of information about the artwork, the title of the artwork, you know, and, and also get some of the perspectives from folks. Again, it really depends on the structure of your program. I think that you can have a balance of these things 
but you have to just be strategic about your time. I think you have to look at the sequence of the things that you want to do. And you could very easily say, I could have sped that up and say, this is an artwork about Sai, by this artist named Sai Guo Chang. This is the year it was made, right? And this is the title of the artwork, right? After I, I would probably always start personally with what people notice, like, hey, what do you know, you know, what do you notice about this artwork and get a few responses? And then I'd probably say, yeah, actually, this is the title of this artwork. You guys notice these arrows. The title is actually borrowing these enemies arrows. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, I think what you want to do is ideally, even if it's a short amount of time, if the shorter it is, you'll have to be more strategic about what you share. But I would never just say, here's the artwork, here's all the information, let's move on. Because I think that that doesn't, they won't connect with it. So I think you want to get them in with something and like, what do you think about this? Like, cause I've done more stand and deliver type um, talks in MoMA's galleries. We don't really do those that much anymore, but when I have done them, I do bring inquiry into it. So you might do like less of that with certain groups and that's okay. You can still have your inquiry moments. You can be like, what do you notice about this? And then you can be like, well, what do you think about this? And then still share information. Does that, does that make sense? Thank you so much. Cause these were all really, really great questions. And I'm going to share the presentation with you so you can see the rest of the slides. I just had a little bit of information really about um, activity-based learning and because you can also do drawing and you can do movement and there's all sorts of stuff. And there's so much information about that in the online courses that you can just really look at on your own. Um, so I'll just pause there and see um, if my colleagues want to input um, or share any information or wrap things up. Um, but, you know, I'm also around too. My contact information is in the presentation as well. So I'm, I'm happy to answer um, other questions remotely too. Thank you so much, Lisa. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for everyone for being so alert and engaged in the evening. I think you have inspired them and every one of us here tonight. And I personally, I just enjoyed it so much especially um, the way you lead us, um, you know, the process that you lead us through to discover an art piece by, you know, starting by looking and observing and it's like peeling back the onion. Uh, I just find it so interesting, you know, because I'm sure we, we have all experienced, you know, going to a museum or a gallery looking at an artwork and very often it's like um, a private activity in your brain that you're looking at it and then, you know, you're asking questions, you're not quite sure what the artist's message is, um, but I really enjoy it today because, you know, not, it's not just an individual interpretation, but also we experience that, um, you know, collectively, as you said, you know, and by doing this, we can connect and engage, uh, you know, with each other while we're looking at the same artwork and exchanging these thoughts and ideas. And like you said, it's no, you know, correct answers. But when we're discussing it, we actually allow us to open our mind and open our hearts, you know, and then it's such a great experience. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. And just to echo what you said, you said something very, very important um, that I want to underscore. Now more than ever, people really want to connect in some way. And what you're doing in this process is you are giving them one permission to not know all the answers because you, because no one can know all the answers. Two, to sort of, you know, in, increase their comfort level. And three, give them when you make them have them make a personal connection, that's what they take home from that with them. They take home and remember, I had this amazing experience with art. And that's something like, think about the times you were all passionate about art. Think about the things that made you passionate about it. And that's what you give people. And that's what they will take with them. And that's what will solidify the experience they have with you. Um, so yeah, thank you for saying that. That's, that's really important. And I can't agree more when you, you know, when you also mentioned about the conversation, because I think, like you said, I'm going to remember the conversation that we had today, maybe even more than the artwork itself. <laughs> I'm going to remember that it's a hedgehog. Yeah, that's so cute. <laughs> right? I mean, how amazing is that? Like, Sammy, I think it's Sammy, who said that? 
yeah. hatch hog. Correct. Yeah, so it was so cute. And we were being just too serious and then suddenly we have this word. Right. <laughs> but it does, it looks just like that. And that's the thing, like I've looked at this artwork so many times and now I'm gonna look at it and go hedgehog, which is so cool. Yes, it was a lovely moment. And well, thank you. Yeah, please keep in touch. Thank you all for your really, really great questions and being so engaged tonight. And I hope you have all enjoyed Lisa's session today. Uh, I will share uh, later on Google Classroom, uh, our recording videos and also Lisa's presentation. Yes. Thank you so, so much, Lisa. You're so welcome. Such a great session and presentation. Thank you so much.